in. I know it's a hard day to come inside. So thanks for making the effort. A few things to get started with this morning. Announcements. Uh, outdoor school is still searching for male counselors. So if there's anyone in here that is has been thinking about applying, uh, but has not yet applied, there are places for male counselors. All of the other positions have been filled. Uh, I sent out an announcement about that before with the contact information, uh, so you can reach out about that if that's interesting to you. Uh, worth two credits. Other announcements. I sent out a message this morning to let you know that the next extra credit week from today, 7 o'clock in 205 Ferguson, and we're changing the movie. Uh, you'll find a different one. It was actually where we had made next. I changed my mind. Um, I think this one will tie in more closely to where we are in the, in the class. And so, um, so next week, next Wednesday, Albatross, a story, a love story for our time from the heart of the Pacific. Um, so you'll be able to catch that as your extra credit movie. You can reuse the sheet of paper that's in there or just write on a separate sheet to hand in to your TA. That's there for you. Also, the new blog post is up. The topic this time is separation. Uh, Andy Goldsworthy, who is a landscape artist, he takes things in nature and creates temporary art installations. If you don't know Andy Goldsworthy, you might look him up. He's a, very, he's a very creative soul. He says, we often forget that we are nature. Nature is not something separate from us. So when we say that we have lost our connection to nature, we've lost our connection to ourselves. So the, the prompt is then, consider Gold, Goldworthy's words in the context of how separation shows up within your own life. Or, if you feel differently than he does, express your own belief and how your belief plays out in your own life. Considering separation. So those are, are things available, extra credit opportunities for you. We're going to be adding another extra credit movie, so we'll be up to then six points that you can earn. There's going to be a movie held here at the State Theater that's relevant to what we talked about on Monday about the, the microbiome of the body. So that movie will be added um, to, I think Autumn actually already added it to the extra credit page. Uh, so you can find that information. We'll send out an announcement about that too. Um, so that's there. So, with all of the logistics stuff out of the way, uh, you can put your feet flat on the floor, ground yourself, bring your attention to your being, all of the beings that make up your being. Take a couple of good breaths, good belly breaths. Remember that you can always empower that vagus nerve of yours. If you feel anxious, if you feel excited, if you feel nervous, if you feel tense, if you feel afraid, you can empower that vagus nerve. You can turn it on by taking those deep breaths. Anytime you feel that stress, any of those stresses, So today's class, today's class is all about insects and things that we don't think much about sometimes. We're connecting to all these different parts of our world, um, centering, opening to new ideas, learning by listening and by being attentive to the world around us and within us, within the people near us. So they're in the family of arthropods. Arthropods includes insects, spiders, and crustaceans. Um, arthropods are often cast out, or we just don't think too much about them because maybe we don't know about them. 
Um, so that's why we spend this class, particularly on insects, thinking about these beings that have an exoskeleton, body segments, they're cold-blooded. It feels like they have almost nothing in common with us. About 80% of the world's species are insects. They all have six legs. They all have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So when you look at this slide, a whole bunch of different insects, we share the world with them. You know, not, if 80% of the species on the planet are insects, that means there are billions of individuals. So take a look at this slide and awaken your curiosity. What questions come up for you? Take time there in your journal to jot down two questions that come up for you. Write down two questions based on what you see in this image. If no questions come up for you, that's interesting too. So why are some insects perceived as cute while others are ugly and disgusting? Mm. Like perceived as. Perceived as, right. That's intriguing. That's a cool question. Hmm. Yeah. Hi, um, I hate bugs, like I don't like them, and 51, the big, like, scary beetle looking one, uh -huh. what is that? <laughs> <laughs> and like, where does it live? Right, that's an awesome question, and we'll have to do some research. It's a beetle of some kind, it doesn't live here, um, but I think that we can find out more information. So, that might actually, might be your extra credit from, uh, from week four, you could do a little research about that beetle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, do they taste good? Ooh, do they taste good? It's a good question. It's a good question. All kinds of questions. Anybody else have a juicy question? Not to build on that last question. I have one up here, Jen. Awesome. Thank you. Are you going to like take this in a particular direction, or is it going to just be like a lot of like just ask questions about bugs? I think it's like it's great, I guess, but like what's right. the point? Yeah, it's the point right down. now. The point right now is to spark your curiosity, right? To kind of bring up something that maybe got lost for you a long time ago. Um, is this natural curiosity. So I'll do my best to take it somewhere. It might work for you and it might not. We'll see. Time will tell. So questions are how we learn about the world. It's our curiosity. We've talked about that. So there are, uh, there are apps that, um, that help us to learn what's in the world around us. Right? So this one is particularly interesting, I think, if you're curious about anything in the natural world. Um, there are over five billion people have devices in this world. It's actually more people in this world have mobile devices 
than have indoor plumbing. Um, so using our devices as a tool to help us figure out what's going on around us, it's a different approach. Um, you can get connected to a community of scientists and naturalists who can help you learn more about nature. With this app, iNaturalist, so they can, you can identify mushrooms and plants and insects, animals, birds of all different kinds. So it's an idea of, of finding a way to connect. So if you find something, you have iNaturalist, you can take a picture through the app and then you can see, figure out, it gives you suggestions about what it is. And if, it, if you aren't sure, you submit your photo, and then most of the time, relatively short period of time passes, and then you get an answer from a local scientist, a local expert, a naturalist, that can help you identify what that is. So there are uh, millions of observations recorded to date, and all of that data can go to inform scientific research. So not only are you collecting the information for yourself, but you're contributing to research projects. And it can, you can use this anywhere in the world. Um, I found it to be really helpful when I traveled down south and there was a tree that I didn't know, I had never seen, and was able to identify it or help figure out what it was. So there are so many things to explore and so many ways to use our curiosity. I, I think that it's a, a, a tool that could be very useful. So we're going to explore a particular insect today. We're going to be thinking about Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So thinking about having a basis for a relationship. Right? So here my hand. Oh my God. <laughs> Madagascar hissing cockroach. exploring or moving more quickly, but instead it's just hanging out, right? So this is the, my favorite teaching tool as far as live animals go, because they don't fly, they don't bite, and it's just exploring me while I'm being curious about it. I'm holding it because I think it's awesome, actually. I think they're very cool. What other questions? Where did you get it from? It comes from the Ag Science Building. They have a tank of them there because they often use them for teaching and there are hundreds of them in, that live in community together there. So we borrow them from the Ag Sciences Building. Um, we, you know, I bring one to class to share with all of you and then I take it back there so it can be back with its community. Would it taste good? It'd be an awfully big bite, an awfully crunchy, and I've never eaten one, so I can't answer your question completely. <laughs> yeah. Question. Um, hi, I'm Christine. Hi, Christine. Can it carry diseases? Uh, sure, we all can. Yes. Okay, but like crazy diseases. <laughs> crazy diseases. Um, I, not that I know of. I mean, there. It's a Madagascar hitting, hissing cockroach. It's, native to the island of Madagascar. Uh, they are decomposers, so they're spending a lot of time on, on, in the ground, on, on the ground. They're gonna be eating dead fruits, you know, fruits that fall from the trees. And so they're eating decomposing stuff. So whether that, you know, is carrying disease or not, 
Um, I would imagine that their digestive system works pretty well to get rid of some of that. And we'll talk a little bit more about another uh, relationship that they have that helps to keep them disease-free. So, so, go ahead. You just answered part of my question, but are they relatively found in like cleaner or dirtier areas? Because like I know some animals and insects are more in like clean areas, like cleaner water streams. But I feel like cockroaches are typically associated with like trash and like dirty areas. Right, because they're taking advantage of it. They're advantageous. Um, but these live on the forest floor. They're decomposers. They're part of what it, they eat the leaves, they eat rotting trees, they live inside of rotting trees and bark. Um, so it depends whether you think of that as clean or as dirty. Uh, it's pretty natural, is the way I would think about it, even though it is dirt. You know, they're pooping out dirt, pretty much. So, what else? Any other questions? Okay, one in the back. How about in the back first? Go ahead. So, if it's a hissing cockroach, does it hiss? It does. They have these spiracles on the sides of their bodies that not only help them to communicate with their hissing, if this guy was upset, this is a male Madagascar hissing cockroach, if he was upset with me, you would, I, you would actually be able to hear it in the microphone. Um, but he's not upset right now. Or he, they also use it for communication when they are um, fighting. So the males will fight over the females. So they hiss. They let out air through those spiracles. It's like little holes along the side of their bodies where they can take in air and that air then goes directly to their, the parts of their body. Unlike our lungs, you know, we only take in air up here and then it circles through our whole body. But they get to take it in, you know, directly closer to where the air, the fresh air, the oxygen needs to go. So they do hiss for a couple different reasons. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Is the Madagascar hissing cockroach considered safe to eat? Because I know some insects are not considered safe to eat. I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I'll have to look that up. That's a great question. I appreciate that. So they are excellent, excellent decomposers. They can climb. They have little hairs on their feet. So if I do this, you know, it's not going to slide off. They can climb up straight, clean glass. Um, it just helps them to do what they need to do. Their young appear to be born live. So out of the back of the female is, comes something called the umutheca, which is where the eggs are held. And in there is where the young come out. I can show you a funky picture of this. Because it just happened here in this room the other day. So those are the babies. When they come out, or when these adults shed their skin, they shed their exoskeleton, um, they are white because it's softer. And then they become darker as they dry, so to speak, as the shells become hard. So these are some of the young as they're being birthed out of the mother. And then, um, and then they could just start moving all around. So it's pretty, pretty exciting to watch. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of an interesting, interesting way of being. So somebody mentioned or asked about carrying disease. These cockroaches are, are particularly clean because they have a symbiotic relationship with mites that live only on them. So when we talked about how we are this multitude of organisms, that's true for this creature as well. So these little things, it's interesting because it's an arthropod living on an arthropod. These mites are pretty closely related to spiders. And they live in the joints and the areas around this cockroach um, because it helps to clean off the food that, you know, so that it doesn't get all gross in places that the cockroach can't clean for itself. It eliminates and eats the organic debris that collects around them. So it would, all that debris would foster mold growth and, and that wouldn't be very healthy. 
So they have a special symbiotic relationship that helps keep them healthy. Um, which is pretty similar, actually, um, to this. This is a picture of a photo of magnified human eyelashes. Uh, and if you check this out, like right here at the base of these eyelashes, there are eyelash mites. They are living on you and they are living on me and they are keeping us healthy. Here's a magnified photo of one of these creatures. There they are. glands right at the base of those eyelashes there are these glands that so you know release the oil uh, the hair follicles it helps to lubricate our skin and our hair and so these are demodex mites that live on us um, the females lay their eggs around the rim of the, the eyelash pore that they're living in uh, they probably don't lay many because one of their eggs is a third to the half the size of their bodies, um, which is obviously very metabolically demanding. So it seems as though, uh, well, I should say, things that they push out of their bodies, they don't, they don't have anuses, so they don't poop. They just eat and eat and eat, which might be comforting. But then, of course, they die, and then all that stuff is still there. And then others come along and clean it up. So these demodex mites have been with our species for a long time. Uh, there's speculation that since we evolved from hominid ancestors, we have carried these demodex mites with us. And it can be interesting that different populations of people around the world carry slightly different species of these mites. And it could be that we can figure out how humans moved around the planet based on what kind of mites they're carrying. So lots to be learned from these arthropods. So quick reminder, just that these cockroaches and the demodex mites are our biological kin. We're all made of the same stuff. So insects. They are the most biodiverse scientific group on the planet. They are the living beings that run the world. So to get to some of your comments and questions at the beginning, you know, why, what are we, why are we learning about this? It's because they play key roles on, on the planet, right? So somebody mentioned already pollinating, and you're right that not all of them do that. They don't all have this job. Um, but without insect pollination, many food plants cannot complete the pollination process and therefore will not produce fruits and vegetables. The plants require pollination to make seeds and make fruit. And many types of animals are part of the pollination process. You know, there are bats and there are birds and even some land mammals help with this. But the most common pollinators are insects. Um, it has been voted that honeybees, the research shows that honeybees are the most important pollinators on the planet. They do most of the work. So the pollen collects on their legs and then they move to another flower. And then just like we watched last week, those pollen parts can fertilize the flowers, which then create the fruit. So fruit, you know, trees put a lot of, or flowers, put a lot of energy into making the fruit. And the fruit protects the seeds and fertilizes, you know, and helps to fertilize those seeds later on. But these insects, without them, we wouldn't have a lot of the products that we really have come to think that we require on this planet. Almonds, nuts of other kinds, fruits vegetables. So pollinating is really 
a key role for insects. They also aerate the soil. Aeration is a naturally occurring process of air exchange between the soil and its surrounding atmosphere. So without aerating the soil, moving that air, then the plants would not be able to grow as well. So aeration reduces the soil compaction, it produces, it, excuse me, it promotes root growth for healthier plants. And so it also allows water to reach deep down into the roots. And so these insects that dig around underneath the soil are helping to make those plants grow better, more healthy. Those microorganisms that live in the soil then are able to break down the existing matter and improve soil quality. So without these insects, we wouldn't be here either. And then of course, you know, insects poop. So they're doing their own fertilizing of the plant of the world, you know, with billions of insects pooping. We've got lots of nutrient cycle going on. And then they, they decompose stuff, like these you know, Madagascar hissing cockroaches, um, but then flies. I talked about Henry's poop and the flies that came to take care of that. Well, this is a piece of raw meat with flies on it. The dead bodies of plants and animals are a rich source of organic matter that provides nutrition for many, many insects called saprophages. They're eating dead stuff. So these are the insects adapted to the lifestyle that are an essential part of our biosphere. Again, without them, we wouldn't be here. And monarchs. Monarchs, as you may know, are on the decline. There is threatened and or endangered species in some places. They migrate south and spend their winters in Mexico. They spend their winter being in torpor, which means their body slows way down so that they don't need to eat. They just slow every, all of their processes down. But in the process of doing that, some of them don't survive. And their bodies go back to the earth. And with the plentitude of insects that are dying, they hold lots of nutrients. And all of those then go back to the forest or go back to the land. And then, somebody said a food source. Yeah, they are for food source for many, many, many other beings. Working, you know, beginning those food chains or being it toward the beginning after the plants. Like this Merlin, um, I spent a lot of time in my professional career um, and now in my personal life hanging out with raptors. And Merlins are awesome. They're in the, the falcon family. They're related to American kestrels. And they catch these um, dragonflies, especially when they're in migration. They catch them right out of the air. And this one is perched. But sometimes they eat them in flight. They can bend down. It's like having a to-go snack. So they are eating insects. And they're just all kinds of animals that are eating all kinds of insects. The idea that people all over the world eat insects and tomophagy, the use of, of insects as food by human beings. Sometimes it's the eggs, sometimes it's the larva, sometimes it's the pupa, sometimes the adults have been eaten by humans from prehistoric times until today. There are 3,000 ethnic groups around the world that practice entomophagy. It's very common in Central and South America, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. 80% of the world's nations eat insects. And yet, in some societies, it's taboo or un just uncommon. Um, I believe that it's it's making an appearance more and more in the United States and in Europe. Um, there are companies that are trying to introduce insects into Western diets. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations has registered 1,900 edible insect species and estimates that there are more than 2 billion insect consumers worldwide, more than one quarter of the world's population. So, 
There's also a suggestion, strong suggestion, that entomophagy might be a possible solution to environmental de degradation due to the amount of energy that meat production takes. They're extremely high in protein. So there was a day that I sent my children off to the insect fair, the great insect fair here at Penn State. Uh, I sent them off with a friend, and when they came home, they were delighted. They had seen all kinds of freaking cool stuff. And there, in my car, the next time I got in, was a little container in my cup holder. And I thought, what the heck? And so I opened it up, and it was a trail mix left from the great insect fair. Um, and in this trail mix were mealworms. My children had tasted all kinds of you know, chocolate-covered crickets and, and mealworms at that, at that festival. And there it was in my car, and I had the, the opportunity right then. And I have to say, I couldn't do it. I'm not there yet. I think that it's really, uh, it's something that pushes me to a place where I'm not yet comfortable. I'm working on it. It's a mind shift. Right? So I'm working on it. Maybe there will be a time. So many of us, um, somebody expressed this, that I don't like insects. Many of us have been conditioned to not like or to even hate insects based on what our role models and their beliefs. So if my mom smashes bugs in our home when I'm a kid, then I am much more likely to smash bugs in my home as an adult. But. If I model, you know, if somebody for me models taking insects out, um, you know, a spider that's under my, that's not an insect, but an, another arthropod, spider that's in the shower, and I take it outside, then I'm hoping that my kids learn to take spiders outside, or even to let them be so that they're killing and eating other insects in our home. So, it's simple, right? It's what we learn, it's how we learn it. What have we been practicing in this class? The idea that beliefs are frozen thoughts, but that we can change them. We can thaw those beliefs and change them. So your prompt this week, the more of the world I'm in relationship with, the more alive I become. We are all beings together in this community of Earth. So here's this guy, the Dalai Lama. He's a transcendent teacher. He's a Buddhist spiritual teacher of the Tibetan people. And yet, a lot of people from a lot of faith traditions really believe that what the Dalai Lama says is wise. He promotes basic human values or secular ethics in the interest of human happiness. He fosters interreligious harmony and the preservation of the Buddhist culture, which is a culture of peace and nonviolence. So some folks went to the Dalai Lama and asked him, what is the most important thing that we should teach our children? And his response to them was, teach them to love the insects. Teach them to love the insects. Why? Why would that be his answer? Why don't you take a moment and talk to your partner about that?
probably because like if you love something that small, then you can have love for other things and be more accepting of more things in your life. Mm, that's a beautiful thought. Thank you. There's one up here on the balcony if you want. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, probably because uh, we all coexist on the planet, so that's most likely why I said love the insects. Sweet, thank you. Um, I think it's if you teach uh, children to love insects, that teaches them a level of like, love and respect for things that don't look like them, and therefore they'll treat the environment and um, you know other people that may not be like them uh, better. There's another one on the balcony to your left. Excellent, thank you. I also think that like a lot of times when humans think that they're more powerful than other humans or other things, that means we can just like dominate them. And I think if you teach children from a young age, uh, just because we're like bigger and stronger than insects physically, doesn't mean that we can just like kill them whenever we want and like, do whatever we want to them. So to respect them and respect their role, that respect the role they play on the earth and everything. Sweet. Thank you. So we have an opportunity for you to spark your curiosity and connect with insects. So each of your TAs has a cockroach. And wondering and thinking about each of those species around the circle having a job. Having a job on this planet. I have, yes, there's somebody with their hand up back there. Thank you. Thanks, Liberty. snakes for years, but I still don't I like being surprised by them, right? I have an appreciation for snakes and bugs, but surprise is a whole different, it brings up a very natural reaction. Thank you for saying that. 
Um, I was the one that dropped in. Um, <laughs> I was trying to show everyone in my group that it wasn't scary. Yeah. And it jumped out of my hands. Oh, yeah. Like, I, like, growing up, like, I loved, like, animals and dirt. I had goats. Mm -hmm. and so, like, I was always down there. And, like, yeah, and stuff in the, I didn't, like, I never cared about insects. Yeah. Like, I never, like, was crazy at all. So I was trying to tell everyone else, like, it's scary. Yeah. And, like, then something uncertain happens, right? Because because they are their own individual beings and with their own power to move and do things. So yeah, so it's a, a unique observation and, and experience. So well, so when I was in kindergarten, we had Madagascar cockroaches and I loved them. Like I let them crawl all over me and my mom like was freaked out. But then when I held it today, like I screamed because I don't know, like, why did my brain change? Like, why am I more afraid now? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a point for reflection, I think, so I appreciate that. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. I appreciate your learning today. We'll take more comments on Monday.